Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist. You know, I've been trying to figure out how the mind works and just what the, how it's related to the brain. Um, but I think we're going to get a little bit of an expansion of that about maybe the universal mind today with our guest, Chris Beach. We're going to go really far out where he's gone and uh, sounds like Star Trek going out where no one has gone. And he's gone to places that a lot of us haven't gone to. And he's come back to tell us something about what those experiences were. Um, if you want to order my new book, uh, it's uh, pre-order it. You can look down on the bottom of the, uh, uh, underneath this and see where you can order it. And I hope you'll subscribe to our our channel, just get the word out about synchronicity and meaningful coincidences. My story for today. In the summer of 1965, I had just finished um, my first year at medical school, and I was going from New Haven to uh, Los Angeles to do research at uh, a hospital in LA. Somewhere in, around Flagstaff, Arizona, I realized, hey, I didn't have a place to stay. I was riding with some guy and just going along with him. I got to find a place to stay. So I called somebody from my college and she knew somebody who lived in L.A. I called him up and uh, went over to his house. And he says, there's the woman who rents to me in the front part of this house is a mystic. I said, oh, I read about that once in philosophy class. Uh, so I went over and knocked on her door and um, I said, hi, I heard you're a mystic. <laughs> and she says, you're the second one. And I didn't know what that meant then. Uh, she said, would you like a mystical experience? I said, yes, I would. So um, she said, come back next Wednesday at midnight. So I had this little motorcycle and came back on that Wednesday at midnight. And she, she gave me a, a glass of milk with this blue liquid down at the bottom. She said, it's called LSD. I kind of read about that in Time magazine, um, but I just didn't know what it was. So I took this LSD and <clears throat> well, I had an experience much of which I can't remember. But one of the things that happened was that I could see green and gold threads between my fingers. Um, it was like cat's cradle with, with strings and rubber bands between your fingers. And I could go like this and I could see these bands stretch and come back together again. And some young woman came and stuck her hand between my hands and it was like the prow of a boat coming through these bands. And it confirmed that I was seeing something that was real. So as I learned to say far later, far out and groovy, that was... That introduced me to a whole thing about tarot cards, astrology. And so when I hit Hate Street uh, in, for my internship in uh, 1968, I was prepared to talk hippie talk. I could do tarot cards and astrology. Well, our guest today st stumbled into or somehow met or was kissed by LSD also. He is Chris Bache, uh, PhD, a professor emeritus in philosophy and religion at Youngstown State University, where he taught for 33 years. He is also adjunct faculty at CIIS, Meredith Fellow at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and on the advisory board of the Groff Legacy Training. An award-winning teacher, international speaker, has written four books. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about one of them, The Living Classroom, and The Living Classroom, where there's something alive in the classroom, at least when Chris is doing it. And we'll talk about, uh, we'll also talk about um, his current book, which is the focus of 
most of our discussion here about his adventures with LSD. He's taken a lot of LSD trips, which he can tell us about, which in our 73 high dose sessions, I mean, high dose, six, 500, 600 micrograms is a lot. Uh, and he'll tell us more about that. But Chris, welcome to the show. And let's start with uh, you walking into Youngstown and a book coming right to you. Hi, Bernie. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you, Chris. Thank well, you very much. That, that's basically what happened. I finished my graduate school in philosophy of religion from Brown University. I was a diet. I was a hardcore agnostic at that time. I'd kind of studied my way out of religion and out of spirituality through all the graduate school. So I started my work as a young professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. And in the first year, I met Stanislav Grof's work, his first book, Realms of the Human Unconscious, had just been published. This was 1978. As soon as I read that book, I immediately saw the relevance of Stan's work, not only for psychology, um, but for philosophy. And I was trained as a philosopher of religion. This was quickly followed by his methodology book, LSD Psychotherapy in 1980. So what I did is I, I wanted to do this work. I just felt a deep intuitive calling to do this work. So between 1979, in 1999, I did 73 high dose LSD sessions, as you said, working between 500 and 600 mics. Now, this is not a protocol that I would recommend today. Knowing what I know now, I would do it very differently. I would be much gentler on myself. I would balance synthetic psychedelics like LSD with more organic. Uh, less powerful psychedelics like psilocybin and maybe ayahuasca, depending upon how you think of those. Uh, but that's what I did. I mean, I just, and I, you know, you, you use the word trip and I understand, uh, but in my way of thinking, I've never tripped. Uh, I've never done psychedelics and stayed in contact with the outside world. I've never gone to a concert, never gone into the woods. I basically learned a methodology of working from Stan Groff. So all of my sessions, I call them sessions, which are kind of based on the, the Japanese term, a seshin. You know, a Japanese meditation retreat is a seshin. Well, for me, a, a psychedelic session is essentially the same thing. It's a period set aside for spiritual practice. So all of my sessions were completely internalized. I was separated from the world. I was protected from the outside world, isolated, lying down with eye shades uh, under the care of a sitter who managed a very carefully curated playlist of music that was used to pace and, and uh, help uh, support the work through the sessions. Now, I like that for the yeah. moment. Chris. Sure. I mean, I mean, this is like a, a superhero story because you had to like uh, keep it quiet. Um, you did. You couldn't let yeah. people know that you were doing this. You were a secret agent for LSD. <laughs> I think you called it uh, for LSD's conveyance out there. Uh, that, that's so cool. I mean, you look like a mild mannered reporter for a great metropolitan <laughs> newspaper. I mean, you got, but you don't have your glasses on anymore. Uh, that 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 you would like do the paper publishing thing and do like, oh, look, I'm a professor, I'm learning stuff, I'm teaching stuff, I'm writing stuff, but behind closed doors. Yeah, I think of it as my daytime job and my nighttime job. And I couldn't, I mean, my good friends in my department, they kind of knew what I was doing, uh, but I'd never brought it to my students. I, I really never brought it to the university. Uh, I felt I had to keep a, a firewall between these two sides of my life, because LSD was illegal at the time, I was part of this underground. Silence was the, was the prerequisite that allowed me to do this work. Uh, the silence eventually became very burdensome, but that was the cost of, of working with psychedelics while psychedelics were illegal. Oh, you, oh, you secret agents, Scott, you know, it's, it's <laughs> you got to sneak around in the shadows, you know, <laughs> you got to be careful. It's part of the fun of it. I mean, we, you, you can say, well, it was hard, you know, okay. <laughs> I mean, it, there's, look at what you were doing. I mean, you call, you're a philosopher of religion. 
Yeah. And now you've developed a, a, an LSD philosophy, as you call it. You yeah. have expanded your mind as a forerunner of what can happen to human minds. And that's so vital to what I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, yeah. you, you've done it. And now you can say, OK, I've done it. It's OK. I can come out of the shadows. I can <laughs> reveal my identity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I retired. I had to retire before I could really come out and do my real work as a philosopher of religion. Yeah, I have a, I have a question of, uh, early on. You, I've heard this now twice in the, in the past from you now and somebody else yesterday, you felt called, you felt that this is what you, Chris Bates, whatever you are, are going to do. Could you tell us what that feeling was like, that this is what you were had to do? Well, I, you know, I, I had finished my dissertation. I was trained as an analytic philosopher. I was looking around for where to go next. And I just, I saw Stan's work and I, I thought, damn, here is an opportunity to actually explore questions that have been matters of theoretical debate for, for centuries. Uh, and I, I, I really believe that psychedelics represents a turning point in the doing of philosophy in the modern era. Of course, we have precedents. We have the Eleusinian mysteries of, you know, of ancient Greece. We have the ayahuasca traditions in uh, South America and Brazil. But in the modern world, psychedelics represent a, I think, a major turning point because our current metaphysics is, is materialist reductionism. So the belief is that the material world is the only thing that's real. Everything else is superstition and fantasy. And we can explain everything in existence by reducing it all to its physical substrate. Oh, I love and, how angry you get when you're saying that. Yeah. It, it's I, I mean, you don't show it too much. You're a mild mannered, you know, kind of guy, <laughs> but it makes you mad. It makes me mad too. And what I'm trying to do with with coincidences is the same thing. We yeah. have to blow up the reigning paradigm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a terrible philosophy because it's so debilitating. It well-intentioned, my colleagues well-intentioned, but they believe that the physical universe came, came about and evolved purely by accident, random processes, chance and necessity. You have no enduring uh, identity beyond your physical body. When your brain dies, you cease to exist. There's no logic to your life. There's no logic to why you face the challenges that you face. And when you're dead, that's it. It's all gone. So it doesn't make any difference. And what a terrible Yikes. philosophy of life to grow up with. So nicely <clears throat> described. Yikes. Yeah. No. Yikes. Well, <clears throat> let's let's go to what might be the later parts of your book, uh, LSD and the Mind of the Universe. Um, let's go to, and then we're going to go in between. What did you learn that we can then now apply as we face our sixth major extinction on this planet. Well, that, that's a big jump, of course. Um, it is a big jump. In, uh, yeah. Let, let me just mention one thing about the process, and then we'll jump into that. Thank My you. understanding that L of LSD and other psychedelics is that they are essentially mind amplifiers. They don't give you a specific experience. They simply amplify consciousness. They make you hypersensitive and how you use that sensitivity very much de determines what unfolds over the course of many sessions. If you contain that creativity and go completely within in a meditative kind of way, then you, the, your unconscious begins to unfold and bring up all sorts of unintegrated traumatic material or just muck and, and glunk. And you begin to work through that and clean through that. And then as that happens, you go deeper and deeper and deeper. You go through a series of death and rebirth processes, which are initiatory processes. The early death is often described as ego death or the collapse of your time space identity. But there are other deaths that follow as you go into deeper levels of consciousness. So. For me, I eventually identified at the end, maybe five core categories or levels of experience, one having to do with 
personal unconscious, uh, the personal mind, one having to do with the collective mind, what Carl Jung called the collective unconscious, one having to do with the archetypal mind, a fourth having to do with the causal mind or the mind of oneness, and the fifth having to do with what I came to call diamond luminosity. So there's the hardest part of telling my story was the length of the journey and how many levels of consciousness I accessed or was I was initiated into over the course of this time. Most people or many people who write about psychedelics, including Aldous Huxley uh, and Houston Smith, write about psychedelics after only a few sessions. You know, Aldous Huxley wrote uh, Doors of Perception after only one LSD set, uh, one uh, uh, session, and John and Houston Smith wrote his book, Cleansing the Doors of Perception after six. So if you're asking me to jump it to the end, you know, I, I'll probably sound like well, um, that that that's okay. I'm I'm really glad you did what you did, but I am I am doing that pressure on you to get to the yeah. end. But you summarized this beautifully. Uh, you took a lot, uh, many sessions, high doses, and you insulated your mind, your consciousness from the outside world. Yeah. And, and you were deliberately, now you, we have to add this, a, phil, a philosopher of religions, and you yeah. wanted to understand the nature of consciousness yeah. and be able to answer the questions that are basic to this thing is like, how does this thing work that we yeah. are part of? Uh, yeah. I wanted to understand how the world works. Yeah, Why that's what I, it is. that's what I'm doing. I mean, I went yeah. to school and I said they're not they're not telling me something, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you're telling me something, yeah. uh, and you're telling us something. Well, I and I would, with hindsight, I would differentiate between three possible uses of psychedelics. There are others, of course, but the three primary ones that stand out is therapeutic healing, which is the primary thrust of the Renaissance taking place with psychedelic today. Uh, the second is spiritual awakening. And the third is cosmological exploration. And it's important to keep these separate because we don't want to evaluate the results of one by the criteria used in the other. So, and many people that I'm in dialogue with often kind of confuse or judge. I think of my work as primarily focused on cosmological exploration, not spiritual awakening. If I were aiming at spiritual awakening, I would have used a very different protocol, much lower doses integrated with meditation. Cosmological exploration is a matter of kind of amplifying your consciousness tremendously, letting all the inner doors of consciousness open, systematically entering new levels of reality, seeing what you can see from within a higher level of consciousness. And it's a confusing process because I found, for example, when you first break through into a new level of consciousness, it's very hard to understand it, very hard to even remember it. Your mind, it's terribly unfamiliar territory. Your mind often swallows it. You can't remember it. But if you go back again and again and again, and you really focus, you, you learn how to stay conscious at levels of reality that previous you couldn't stay conscious on. And you learn how this level works. You learn how what the rules are. You learn how to navigate it. And if you keep pushing, and if your protocol is powerful enough, eventually you come up to a barrier, to a level, and you have to go through yet another death and surrender and rebirth, and you're catapulted into a deeper level of reality that works with different rules, different, pro different methods. Um, and same thing begins. You, you're, it's, you have to learn how to be conscious at that level again. And then this process repeats as often as you have the willpower uh, to keep driving. In the beginning of this work, my spiritual traditions had said, well, there is a goal, there is an end stopping point, becoming one with God, or becoming one with the universe, or becoming dissolving into the void. Uh, well, what I found in my work was that really wasn't the case. 
I discovered that it was an infinite progression. There were, the universe is so vast, the consciousness of and behind the universe is so vast, we'll never get to the end of it, even using such a powerful method. You can enter into oneness. There is a profound peace in oneness that you can absorb tremendous insights into what is taking place in our cosmological unfolding. Tremendous respect for all of the ancient seers and contemplatives who have been penetrating these domains for thousands of years in their own you know, spiritual lineages. But it's an infinite, infinite universe. I'll never get to the end of it. So I consider my work simply that of a, an explorer registering his observations, which would be put side by side with the observations of other explorers, but with an understanding that in the end, we're exploring a landscape which we have not yet come close to really comprehending in, in its totality. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm so glad you make the difference between spirituality and uh, the cosmological exploration. So mm -hmm. glad that you do that. Because I, I, to me, it's also, I'm so curious about how this thing works. Mm -hmm. And it looks like it keeps going on. In mm -hmm. my life, particularly in the last 10 years or so, I've gone through stages very similar to what you described, where I hit my head against something and I'm oh, mad, what's this? <laughs> and I have to figure it out. And then, okay, it's a new level of consciousness that I reach. And new yeah. people come in and new relationships change. And yeah. it's, it's a similar kind of progression, but it's right here. And I, that's where I tend to be. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I, I, I got to say, psychonaut just, just because uh, that's what uh, you sound like. Um, <laughs> that's the first name for or one of the early names for it. But one of the key questions, one of the key descriptions you you had is of, of the several different, of the five different um, uh, mind spaces. I don't know what the mm -hmm. word you use for it. Yeah, or, that's fine. Uh, where, where you archetypal, I'm working backwards, collective unconscious, which for Jung, archetypal and collective unconscious were related to each other. That's where the yeah. archetypes existed. So I'll leave yeah. that one alone. And then the kind of the, where we are now, the personal unconscious, which Freud tried to uh, explore and did. And mm -hmm. so I, I agree with, I mean, I thought the same thing with the causal, I mean, with, with what you described up to that, but then you describe the causal yeah. And then you describe the diamonds. Yeah. So would you please talk about, you've mentioned causal and one, and That's then true. the diamonds become where we're going to go, I think. So let's please describe, what do you mean by causal plane? Well, let me start just under that so that what I'm going to say about that level will make more sense. Okay. <clears throat> when the shell of your personal identity is dissolved or softened or when it pops, Consciousness opens beyond your personal life history. And it doesn't just pop into God or pop into oneness. There are so many, there are many intermediate levels. One of the levels it opens up into is the mind of your species. Your mind is a fractal embodiment of the larger mind of your species, which is itself part of the mind of the planet a mammalian life, part of the planet, and so on and so forth. Uh, and a lot of my work after the first two and a half years, I went through a two-year period where not just insights into the collective psyche, but the purification that was taking place, the healing that was taking place, did not involve <clears throat> my personal <clears throat> healing, but it involved being task with healing some of the historical trauma that is still embedded in the collective unconscious coming from thousands and thousands and thousands of years of human history. After two years of that work that came to a crescendo and I was catapulted into another level of, of consciousness. Chris, were you able to do healing and notice that you had been able to? Well, <clears throat> for a long time, I didn't understand what was happening. I thought this was part of my, a deeper ego death. Of yourself, <clears throat> yes. But it went on for so long, and it lasted, it was so deep 
eventually I came to a completely different interpretation. And to understand that something was using my sessions in order to facilitate a healing of the collective psyche. And uh, because I was experiencing for hours and hours vast fields of collective suffering, collective anguish, rage, vicious terror, just and just opening up to landscapes of, of anguish, which I called the ocean of suffering. And eventually I came to understand that it represented some type of aggregated memory clusters that the, the species as a whole remembers its history just as we remember our individual history. And that when you're working in these expanded states of consciousness, these states of consciousness use those opportunities to heal and you heal in the, at the collective level just as you heal at the personal level by remembering, by re-experiencing, by differentiating the, yourself from those memories and so by consciously allowing myself to, to experience what was being given to me to experience at this collective level, I believe some type of unquantifiable healing was being mediated uh, to the collective psyche. I don't have any documentation. Or of course you don't. Of, co of course you don't. Uh, yeah. th this is all intuitive, uh, yeah. but it's so parallel process to the individual change yeah. uh, that th that it seems like we have to use analog reasoning we can't do all the data and we have to use yeah. intuition to be able to come up with stuff so you described yeah. it so beautifully that whatever this entity was this cosmic mind uh, it was using you as an instrument to remember the collective pain of of the species yeah. and be able to experience it and separate from it yeah, and this is common in the spiritual traditions. The spiritual traditions recognize this phenomenon. And they say one of the first things you must do in, in deep spiritual practice is what's called uh, uh, the arising of bodhicitta in Buddhism, which is the wish to save all sentient human beings. It is not a sufficient motivation to simply wish to save yourself or to, to awaken your private self. The only motivation which is deserving of enlightenment is the wish to save all sentient beings, all beings. And so this is, this is a, nothing unique to psychedelics, nothing unique to me. It's just part of the spiritual practice. Okay. Um... Right. So then when that came to a crescendo, <laughs> that ocean of suffering after two years came to a crescendo uh, and it never returned. I don't, and that what became an issue for me. Why did it not return? Uh, because clearly the human species is still suffering. And so I addressed that in the book, but what was happened is that I was catapulted into another level, which I came to call the archetypal level. And I differentiate between a high archetypal level, kind of a neoplatonic level or quasi-platonic and a lower archetypal level, a quasi-Jungian level. And it, starting at the lower level, it wasn't, I didn't experience what Jung meant by archetypes, though I'm sure that they're there. Uh, I experienced the, the human species as a unified being. And I experienced networks of uh, intelligence are almost neurological networks running throughout the entire species. And in many, many sessions or I was given teachings about how the human species functions as an, as an integrated singularity. Not oh, so to... great, man. It's so great. Yeah. Uh, so great to hear that. Because I'm coming up with this idea of a psychotherapy for the collective human organism. Yeah. And that's, and you're describing the organism yeah. and with its neural networks. We're already hardwired. We're, we've, we've been working it. We're like this from the beginning. We're just simply discovering it and maybe using it in a way that will be productive. But it's always been like this. The individual and the collective have always been involved in this synergistic dance 
where the collective shapes the individual, but the individual feeds back into and influences well, the What collective. you meant by archetypes, and that's where I'm confused, uh -huh. the Jungian archetypes, there's something missing in those, and I've always known yeah. that. And yeah. you're, you use the same term as the higher archetypes, but what I heard, and correct me if I misunderstood you, but uh, the, these neural networks that connect our minds as a way of yeah. talking about it, that seem, that function, that make, have us function together. It's it's yeah. a collective human organism's mind that, for me, that's my term that you are describing. Yeah. And I'd like to yes. know more about what you saw about that. Well, what I saw was that our individual healing is informed by and influences our collective healing. And it's not just our mind. Our, our physical bodies are actually almost in some way neurologically networked together so that disease is not a private phenomenon. It's not just social in its cause, but our individual healing has a ripple effect that influences other people who have the same diseases that we're struggling with. Whoa, hey, all right, baby. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you're you taking it good, man. You I just got to pause on that one for just a second. That's why I got to stop her in there. That that is that image is so right, and I know I know it, but I haven't heard it. And thank you. Yeah, yeah, it it was truly stunning, and that really was what became the theme of my second book, Dark Night, Early Dawn, and that is to reconceptualize spiritual development understanding this interplay between the collective and the individual, that there is no such thing as private healing or private realization. It's all collective. Or it, private thoughts either. Yes. I mean, uh, the internet is, oh, privacy. Uh, yeah. But coincidences, uh, at least, are showing yeah. us our minds are connected, not yes. only to each other, but to our environment. And yeah. it, I, I'm just like yeah. an ant kind of yeah. piecing these little lines together that you've already seen. Uh, and I so appreciate being able to see the picture of the fuller picture of what, I, what I'm trying to be able to do something with yeah. in this synchronicity business. And there are, there are thoughts that well up from underneath us that we may think of as our private thoughts, but really it's a collective thought that's coming up underneath all of us. It's like a tide that floats many ships. And so there are, and that's what I would mean by archetypal in this sense, that there are thought processes um, of the species as a whole, which touches all of our lives. And there are processes in history which are manifesting from, from a central core. And I think this is happening particularly at our time in history because this is a time of history of intense detoxification. We are laying the foundation for a new uh, level of consciousness to emerge in the future. But we'll, we'll let's get to that, that we'll, and we'll come back to that. Yeah, I, now I want to, don't want to go there because yeah. I want to hear more about what, what you've yeah. got here. Um, the the idea that the ideas uh, bubble up for kind of emerge from below, I use the idea of the psychosphere that yeah. that it's like the noosphere from De Chardin that our minds are in in a, a kind of um, mental atmosphere and the yeah. ideas are floating around out there and for those of us who are kind of like reaching because we have to we grab the fish of the idea and pull it down here and maybe write a book about it uh, yeah. the, and, and but the, the ideas are there for people to grasp and yeah. and and I find myself irritated because i think i come up with these great ideas <laughs> yeah. uh, and i don't remember what they are uh and i can't write them down um but what i get told uh, and i get this when i'm in the forest uh yeah. what i get told is you are an idea machine factory you just put them out there other people can pick up some of them so don't yeah. worry about it just make the ideas okay put them yeah. out there and the other thing i found is that when you get an idea and you bring it in and you refine it, you put it out and, and it really feels like a novel idea. Yeah. Then you discover that other people are having similar ideas and you realize there is no such thing as a private new idea. These ideas are welling up in their time. And we all, if we're lucky, we catch an early part of the wave, but there is a wave moving through.
simultaneous mm. discoveries, independent, supposedly simultaneous discoveries. Yes. So I try to tell people, if you have kind of a, a weird experience, sorry, yeah. somebody else is having one right now like that, yeah. or, or somebody just did a while ago, or somebody's going to, yeah. uh, we're not that special, because I play around with the idea of uniqueness. We're both unique and very much not unique. Uh, we're yeah. part of the same thing. But man, you've got, okay, anyway, besides my getting too excited <laughs> about this. So. Well, let, let's go to the higher archetypal level, the, kind of the quasi-platonic level. So this and neural I, network thing is not uh, at the high level? That, no, that, I kind of think of that as kind of the... Stan Groff differentiates between psychic level transpersonal experiences, subtle level, causal level, and high and low versions of each. And I, I think of what I've just been describing as the low subtle. The, the different subtle level reality for me is when you begin to have experiences of the architecture, the deep structure that lies behind individual or material reality. It's, it's kind of like the steel girders that hold up the building before the rooms have been added in. Our individual mind is a private room, but it's structured within the architecture of this larger building. So you let go of individual mind and you can bump into, you can experience the underlying deep structure of reality in different ways. And part of that for me, when I went into high subtle level reality, I experienced archetypes. I experienced Plato's idea that there is a reality behind time and space, which is more real than time and space. This is a very diso you know, disorienting experience to go somewhere which is more real than your physical existence. But I didn't experience archetypes the way uh, uh, Plato described them. I did not experience unchanging ideas in the mind of an eternal being. I experienced these beings as living beings that are existing on a different order of time in a different dimension of reality. And these are, these are the life force which construct time and space itself and some of the fundamental deep girders of time and space within which there is the species mind with its collective dynamics, but these were different order. And I couldn't, I mean, I experienced these things but I could not wrap my mind around them. I could not give them tangible form. The best my mind could do in the experience was to see them as galaxies, as you know, these astronomical phenomena that are billions of light years across, just huge. And, and that was my intuitive articulation of these archetypes. They did not take physical form beyond that. They, they were not like anything that we had seen in history. They were beyond the gods. They did not look like the gods. They, but they were this reality behind reality. Yeah, yeah. And, and there was an intentionality in them. That's, yes. the, that's the amazing thing that you're describing. You couldn't yeah. see them because your mind couldn't conceptualize them. You can't have the words for it. But you did have the feeling, the sense that they are doing something about the architecture that uh, we have our little rooms in. Uh, yes. that, that, that you could, that kind of intentionality. Yeah. These are cosmic archetypes, not species archetypes. They're cosmic archetypes, and it's a cosmic intentionality. Yeah. Well, I, I got to take a minute to like uh, absorb that because I can conceptualize a cosmic intention intentionality because intentionality is kind of vague to me anyway when I have one. Yeah. So I don't know where it comes from. It's just somewhere yeah. around here. Uh, so cosmic intentionality is the highest form of the archetypes that you're talking about from what I can yeah. tell. Yeah. The, okay. So my, my, uh, my experience putting together a lot of different experiences into one coherent model is that the one manifests the world of diversity. So from the Buddhist language, Dharmakaya manifests a Nirmanakaya. The one becomes in Taoism, it says the 10,000 things. But between the one and the many, 
there are many, many levels of intermediate reality. It's not a simple process. It's, it's actually a complex process of descending. I mean, Sri Aurobindo saw this clearly in his work, descending orders in which the higher orders inform and structure the lower orders. And the, the lower orders influence the higher orders, but there is an, a downward flow so that before something manifests in the physical world, it has manifested in, in the non-physical intermediate structures. Okay. 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 Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you used the word one in there. And uh, I think we got the idea that the one is infinite uh, and that you can't, you can melt into the one. Which, yeah. are, which is what you meant, what you basically mean by spirituality. Yeah. But for those who like to explore, it just keeps going on for, for inf infinitely. Now, you, you describe uh, two other levels that I'd yeah. like to get to before we get okay. to what I asked well, you. Well, what well, happened was the after exploring this archetypal level, and these are soft boundaries, of course. You yes, know, yeah. After exploring this dimension for about a, a year and a half, I went through another kind of death and rebirth process. And I entered a year of extraordinary blessings. And this is what I am calling causal mind or the mind of oneness. At subtle level reality, the world is still a world of duality. It's just that the pieces of that world are extraordinarily big. But when you go into causal level reality, it's a, it's a different experience of that, of reality, so that you experience everything from within the, the, the framework of oneness, you experience the world as being fundamentally one. And small, small dualities, large dualities are sort of absorbed into or subsumed within a pervasive oneness. Now, there, there are many levels of oneness, there are many degrees of experiencing oneness, you can experience oneness as an intuition that opens very early in the journey. And then there are degrees of oneness that open as the course progresses. During this year, and there are four sessions I describe in the book, I experienced um, profound oneness and uh, what the Buddhists call shunyata, emptiness of self. Uh, because when you experience the world as one, it's immediately obvious that there are no private separate cells. You know, there are functional cells, but there's no ontologically separate self. So emptiness of self and oneness are two different sides of the of same, the same thing. Yeah. yeah, of the same thing. Zero equals infinity is my simple way of talking yes. about it. Yes, and then experiences of the cosmic void, uh, the 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 absolute formlessness that underlies all form and gives birth to form, experience of cosmic love, just overwhelming uh, love. And of course, love is the, in a sense, the emotion or the affect of oneness. We experience love because the world is one and the way the world feels about itself is love. Would you and, say that? Would you say that again? Because the word love gets thrown around in so many different ways. Yeah. So uh, let's 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 do that. Let's walk through that one a little yeah. more slowly, please, Chris. Well, <clears throat> here I'm speaking about cosmic love. Yes. Uh, and I think other orders of love are variations within that larger context. But as I understand it, as I experienced it, the world is one at its deepest level. And even as it manifests as diversity, it still retains the fundamental order of one. It holds its oneness. So the differentiation takes place inside oneness. And we might say that the, the feeling that the one has for itself is love. Love is the feeling of oneness. So that when one person loves another person, they, they bridge their separation and they, they feel one together. Uh, when a parent loves their child, they bridge the difference and they are one family together. Cosmically, oneness is the experience of, excuse me, love. Cosmic love is the experience of oneness 
in the world of differentiation, in the world of mnemonic there, there, There's a bit of a wonderful slip in there, which I don't think is a slip in what you said. Uh, cosmic love is the cosmos loving itself. Yeah. Now that, that sounds an awful like, lot like you got to love yourself before you can love somebody else. That one. <laughs> that, that's another truth, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a, so we already got the model out there. Yeah. The cosmos loves itself. Join the party and, and yeah. learn to love yourself and then you'll be one with the cosmos loving itself. Uh, yeah. That's, that's crazy, man. That's beautiful. It's, that's, it's that's... kind of like love is the blood that runs through the body of the universe. It and now you've used that one before, and I hope you use it again. Uh, yeah, it's that's just, a, that's yeah. a good that's a good line right there. Yeah. Love, lo, say it again. Love, love is the blood that runs through the body of the universe. It love saturates the, every cell. Love is the blood that runs through the the body the, of the, the universe. Body, love is the love is the blood that runs through the body of the universe. Yeah, just just as our body is saturated with blood. You poke it anywhere and blood comes out. It's all saturated with blood. And blood kind of helps our body be one. You know, it functions as one. And the same thing is true of the cosmos. That, that oneness isn't fractured when it creates diversity, when it creates elements and elements create galaxies and so on and so forth that oneness is always held, it's always primary. And spiritual traditions tap into that truth. And that's why spiritual teachers say such ridiculous things like, um, love your enemy. <laughs> I am my brother's keeper. Uh, it's that affirmation of the deeper oneness that underlies and, tr and supersedes all the reason, all our separations, all of our boundaries that we put up between people boundaries of different religions, boundaries of race, boundaries of politics. But I think it's I think it's really easy to say love your enemy uh, and really hard to feel it. Yeah, and hard. one of the one of the things that I am so intent on is is recognizing that, uh, yeah, we're all connected and we're all part of the same thing, but we don't yeah. know how to get along with each other. We have yeah. a lot of trouble getting along with each other. I'm a psychotherapist. I've written books about psychotherapy. And yeah. that's why I call it the psychotherapy for the collective unconscious, because yeah. we're, we're, we're missing how to be able to love each other in a way that doesn't have to be like uh, a lovers loving each other, but there's something else that has to happen. We need yeah. to be able to do that. And that's where I want to do the diamond part of, uh, uh, of what you're talking about, but I want to, yeah. most important as you can hear for me, and I think for some of our audience is to be able to know the practical ideas that you've come away with because you have come away with how to be able to think about what we're having to transform here as human beings yeah well you know let's let's translate love in different there are different aspects of it we could say respect we could say uh fairness we could say honor you know, so um, love carries an emotional oh, quality, good, good, good. but Justice. there are these other ways of describing it. Fundamental respect, fundamental egalitarian fairness. And the, that's love. I mean, that is oneness. So however we articulate oh, 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 oneness oh. in the world of many is part of that core experience of love. Excellent. Excellent. You know? So justice social justice. justice yes you know family justice racial justice gender justice all that is part of the of oneness maturing within the species opening up to the underlying oneness of the truth of oneness in life well i thank you personally for that because when i was a first year resident i was criticized for being egalitarian <laughs> yeah well <laughs> so much for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're just, it's, there's a lot of things that come along to kind of reinforce what I kind of knew, but it's nice to yeah. hear it from the outside. Yeah. Could you, could you tell us what you mean about uh, what you refer to as crystal? Crystal. Well. The crystals in the universe, the diamonds of the universe. I'm the sorry. diamonds. Yeah. After 
a year spent at this causal level. I was 15 years into my work. Um, there was still five years to go. And I was completely uh, existentially satisfied. I mean, I had been dissolved into oneness, into the void, into love. I, 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 I couldn't imagine anything better or deeper. Uh, but what happened was I went through yet one more very intense death rebirth process. In fact, the dying process lasted an entire eight hour session. And the next session I was taken immediately into a reality that was entirely new. Uh, it was a crystalline, clear state of consciousness. The, the clarity was just overwhelming. It, it was just breathtaking. Uh, it was deeper than anything I had ever experienced in any of my sessions up to that point in time. Uh, I called it the death state because it, there was an experience of you die at all other levels of reality in order to be born and to be absorbed into this domain of pure, pure, pure crystalline light. I mean, I had known light many times before, but this was this was different. This reminds and me of the Ain Sof of the Kabbalah. It is like that, isn't it? I eventually came to associate it and Buddhist metaphysics is kind of the system I know the best, even though I've studied many, but it's the one I'm most comfortable operating in. Uh, I came to associate this with what Buddhism calls Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality, the light out of which the universe emerges in the Big Bang. Uh, and over the next four years, I got back into this reality only four times in 26 sessions, only four times. In between those times was usually about a year of very intense purifications. Because Every time you go into a cleaner, pure state of reality, you have to detoxify at a whole new level in order to stabilize consciousness. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. Yeah. And so it, I'd go through a year of intense purification <clears throat> and then would be graced with being brought back into this diamond luminosity experience still deeper. And then another year of intense detoxification and then return. And what happened over those four immersions is that the first two took me deeper and deeper into diamond luminosity. But then the, the third and fourth did not take me deeper into diamond luminosity. It took the diamond luminosity deeper into my physical being. Wow. So it was crunching not only into my psychological matrix, but it was crunching into my physical matrix. I could feel it changing my biochemistry as it was saturating my physical body. Um, uh, thank you for that, too, because I went through an experience, no details necessary, but uh, where I, I know my body went through uh, some kind of change. And, and I, I like comic books, so it was a, a lot like the superhero, uh, ordinary guy getting transformed by some lightning thing or some radiation yeah. or drinking the wrong thing. Well, yeah. I, I had something where I was pretty sure I went looking around. Did anybody have this kind of experience in the comic books like yeah. I just had? And I think... I, 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 again, on this plane, I, I get the parallels on this plane of what you just described. And I study yeah. the tarot cards and Kabbalah mm -hmm. and the, the Eitz Chaim, the tree of life. And it's, it's, it's various shades of light as you go yeah. higher up in it yeah. uh, are where I can identify with some of what you have just described about the yeah. crystal and diamond yeah. being part of you. States of consciousness are also states of body uh, so that anytime by hook or by crook you enter a deeper pure larger state of consciousness your body is taken with you into those states so, and so the the detoxification is not just the detoxification of your mind and emotions your heart but it's literally a detoxification of your body you you can feel you can smell your body sweating it out you can see it in your not to get too intimate but you can 
it, your your poop stinks yeah. terribly yeah. for days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One yeah. of these things. Yeah, mine changed yeah. shape a lot and did funny things. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a whole package. It's a whole package. Hey, yeah. there's something going on here. Here's <laughs> yeah. a signal from the inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm not as reluctant to talk about poop as a message that, that because if you look at it um because i've been a doctor and i know we can look for stuff in there because yeah. it is a message from the inside about yeah. what's going on with you sometimes i look in the toilet and say okay what is this about and today there was a transformation yeah <laughs> okay <laughs> that must be something else happening here that looks like it's more regular now uh yeah it's getting more normalized so, yeah yeah I, we the metaphors are all around us about what's yeah. happening and that's yeah. that's what i'm nearsighted so that's what i see you yeah. are very farsighted <laughs> <laughs> very farsighted well chris let's get to yeah let's get to the collective human organism and the current um difficulty it's yeah. having with itself because it is currently on a suicidal uh mission uh, yeah about it to kill itself to be yeah here's Seems my, to be. my take on this, and it, it's a purely visionary take. When it comes to data, I have, you know, I have to use the same data that everybody else looks at in terms of how to understand what's happening on our planet. But as far back as 1991, I began to have a series of visions that were part of my sessions uh, uh, that were consistent over years. And there were visions of humanity, that humanity was coming to a turning point in its history. It was coming to a before and after point. It was coming to a period of profound spiritual breakthrough, of spiritual illumination, and generating an entirely new relationship between each other's uh, human beings and between the individual and the divine. Uh, just over and over again, uh, it was showing me that everything that's happening in history was in service of this tremendous evolutionary pivot point that humanity was coming to. And this pivot point was filled with blessings. Right? But nowhere did it tell me how it was going to pull this off. How was nature going to pull this off? And then when I was in the diamond luminosity stage of work, and I would, had gone through my first contact with the diamond luminosity, and the second contact, and I, I was a year into the purification process, and I thought I was going into diamond luminosity again. Instead, my session took me very, very deep into what I call deep time. Time had become permeable in my sessions, so that I going into the future was, or not just into the future, but into a different way of experiencing time. Larger, larger blocks of time being experienced as simultaneously present or accelerating time so that you can experience tens of thousands of years in a minute. I know it sounds extreme, but that was just- Don't worry, don't worry about it. The whole, your whole thing sounds yeah, extreme, so don't worry does. about it. Yeah. You're an extreme kind of guy, mild-mannered <laughs> reporter from deep the deep void. Yeah, that's what you are, a mild-mannered reporter from the deep <laughs> void. So it, it's not, keep going. Yeah. Well, in this session, which I call uh, the Great Awakening session, I, I label, I give my sessions names to help me remember them. Uh, I was, I dissolved into the collective psyche and I dissolved into deep time. I was taken deep into the future and i experienced the death and rebirth of humanity as the species i experienced as this billion cell organism going into a period of history where things were falling apart we were losing control structures were breaking down uh, a tremendous pain uh, pain and suffering the, the assumptions of our life were dissolving out from underneath us. Uh, we were losing control of everything we had known. And it looked like we were going into an extinction event. It looked like we were going on to a, a death event. And of course, extinction is one of the strategies of evolution. We, we know that there are dead ends in evolution all the time. It looked like this was a dead end for humanity. 
But then in my session, just when things were at its worst, it was like a hurricane going over an island. And then the eye of the hurricane moved on. And there were some of us who were still alive. Many had been killed, but there were people who were alive. And when we began to pick ourselves up, we discovered that we had been changed by this crisis that had overcome us. We were different human beings. We weren't just, and when we began to come together and to find each other and to rebuild society, everything was new, new values, new insights, new uh, perceptions of the good. Uh, our minds were more sensitive and more open. Our hearts were more connected and more open. It, we were literally a new humanity building a new culture, not just a different economics and a, a more eco-friendly economics and a different political structure, social structure, but literally there was a new human being that had that, that the crust of the old human being had been ruptured and a new human being was emerging. And this experience, it was a devastating experience. It literally took me a year to recover from this experience. I, I kept walking around my hometown feeling like I was walking around Hiroshima a week before the bomb was dropped. And, and I felt such tremendous respect for all the human beings I was seeing who at a spiritual level had chosen to incarnate to participate in this decisive turning point in humanity. So my understanding was that we have been gestating. We have been working towards this turning point for thousands and thousands of years. And my understanding of this is through reincarnation. We have been reincarnating and reincarnating and reincarnating and growing and growing and growing. So the gestation has been in process for a long time, the gestation of this new human. But the labor, the birth of the human is a short period, very intense, filled with convulsions. And now humanity has entered the labor of giving birth to the future human. We are experiencing the convulsions of the dismantling of the world built by ego the dismantling of these highly self-preferential structures that saturate our society and our history, breaking down that culture, breaking down those structures and, and giving birth to a new form of human being. And in the last major vision of my journey in the 70th session, I was put through the worst strip down of any of my sessions and I was taken deep into the future and given my deepest experience of this new emerging archetype that I'm calling the future human. People call it different things. It's other people are recognizing, intuiting this transformation. And this being is, is not just a little new and improved human being. This being is, is it, it it represents a fundamental shift in the plate tectonics of the archetypal psyche. This is a birth that's taking place deep within us. And it is the manifestation of the next evolutionary step of humanity. Now, separately in a related series of sessions, I came to see this as a natural organic culmination of reincarnation. That reincarnation, as it's usually conceptualized in many of the Eastern traditions, you grow, you grow, you grow, uh, you get more compassionate, wiser, more understanding, so on and so forth. And eventually you reach a point where you awaken to the divine within. You awaken to the, this universal divinity that's within all things. And when you awaken, then you can leave time and space then you graduate, you don't have to incarnate anymore. Uh, and I, I think that I understand that idea, I really do. But I think it's a, it's a premature and mistaken understanding of the evolutionary impulse. What happened in my sessions is that there was one particular day when I began to experience all my former lives coming into me, just coming in, it was like wrapping a, 
a thread of white light around the kite spool. They were just coming in fast and furious. And they reached a critical mass. And when they reached a critical mass, all this energy fused into one. And when all my lives fused into one, I was catapulted into a state of consciousness far beyond anything I had known previously. And I call this the diamond soul because the, when I became one, when it became one, a diamond light broke out of my chest and that's what catapulted me into the state. I was both an individual, but I was an individual of a different order of being than I had ever known before. And I think this is a process which all of humanity is going through. We, and we are all giving birth to the diamond soul in history, which is simply to say, we're giving birth to the soul. And by soul, I mean the consciousness that integrates all of our former lives into a singularity. Now, it, it, many centuries of our existence, our former lives exist as unintegrated fragments uh, within us. Uh, but as we grow and as we mature, we begin to integrate. We integrate their pains. We heal their pains. We integrate their knowledge into our conscious being. I think what is happening, to get down to the nit and gritty, I think we are, have entered what Hinduism calls the Kali Yuga, the time of great purification. We are literally detoxifying the entire planet of the of the karma are the are the cause effects of our lower level of evolutionary development by which i mean the evolutionary development which recognizes the self but doesn't recognize the underlying unitive fabric of reality underneath the self so the world which we have constructed is a world built by the ego and in that world I can take from you and appropriate to me and my world gets better and yours doesn't, but that's okay. But in the world created by the soul, which has an immediate awareness of the connective tissue of life and a deeper porosity, a deeper capacity to receive or to enter into living communion with the intelligence of the universe, that being creates a different social order. That being creates a world that works for all. That being creates a planet that's different than the planet that we have created up to now. And that's what I think is happening. We can no longer afford the luxury of a planet which is guided by egos, even well-intentioned egos. We are giving birth to the soul on this planet. And once that process takes place, we make a turn in human evolution, just as decisive as when we got the 50% increase in our brain about 100,000 years ago, a decisive turning point in our social psychological development. So what, what can, is there anything we need to do here? Or we just kind of go on for the ride? Uh, both and, I think. You know, in terms of practical things, uh, my dear friend, Bruce, uh, uh, Dwayne Elgin, uh, who's been a futurist for a long time, has been pondering this process that I've been describing through multiple books. Uh, he's one of the fathers of voluntary simplicity. His most recent book is a book called Choosing Earth. And he describes in, in devastating detail what all the scientific evidence is telling us about what the next 50 years are likely to look at, look like in terms of the impact of this series of eco crises that are going to hit us again and again, taking us deeper and deeper into this crisis. But he also has a, a large section of the book is focused on what we can do. What can we do to accelerate this process at an individual and a personal level, what can we do to, to buffer the worst of the pain of this social transformation? How can we live 
how can we cooperate with this evolutionary pivot that we're making? He knows, I think he has deeper insights into this than I do. Uh, he's thought he's a social activist at heart. And he's he's really understands some of the things that we can do psychosocially, individually, and collectively to accelerate this process. From my perspective, we could list some things that we might do, and there would be not there would be very few surprises in them in a way. But I'd ask to add a, a certain perspective. From my perspective. Each one of us, before we were incarnated, we knew what we were getting into. We knew what this century was about. We knew what was here. And we all made a conscious choice to participate in this pivot and to incarnate in a way which allowed it placed us in a way that allowed us to contribute to this process. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, and that means that we don't have to go looking it's what right. needs it's, to be it's, done. It's just right. To, right here. It's right here. And it's right like here. how you knew that you had to do this work. And yes. like, I know that I got to do this coincidence thing. I mean, I, yeah. why am I doing it? I don't know. It's my job. I mean, it's what I say it's about my so, job. That's what, that's what I that's what I got to yeah. do. I don't know why, but it feels good and I need to do it. I mean, yeah. each of us is a cell in this giant human organism yes. and has a function within that uh, collective human organism. And yes. we got to find it. And that'll make things maybe a little easier for yeah. everybody. And it'll take it'll take all of us and all of our professions. It'll take doctor healers and social activists and educators and therapists and artists and politicians. It'll scientists. It'll take every one of us and all of our skills. And so the real issue is not what should we do. The real issue is do we have the courage to do what we know needs to be done? It's under our feet. Okay, and then I'm I'm going to still add my my two cents in this is that in order to have in order to do it, we have to have the courage to learn how to relate to each other better than yes. we do. Absolutely, the, we these these cells in the CHO have to cooperate as well as be individuals. That yeah. whole thing about I'm separate and I'm part of the whole thing comes down to what we have to do here on this planet with each other and, and love yeah. as you've described it uh, in its many ways to manifest respect, um, uh, justice, um, those, those ideas about oneness here and self-love and loving others are so much an important part of what we need to be able to do. Yeah. Now we've, we've come to the more yeah. than the end of this, Chris, and uh, I've, I'm, I'm one of your students in the class in the living classroom because uh, you have popped uh, several things in my mind mm -hmm. that needed to be popped by what mm -hmm. you're saying. Uh, one of them being uh, Hiroshima, walking around Hiroshima a week before I walk around Charlottesville, Virginia, looking at how these they're not going to be able to make all these kids all the time they're not yeah. going to be able to drive these big cars all the time they're not yeah. going to have the food that they're luxuring at and and the kind of fun things they do relationship wise they're going to have more yeah. pressing things to to push and i look around and i'm so glad unfortunately it's true but here you mirror that as well as so many other yeah. things that you said um so yeah. uh, and let me let me build on that and that when we do what that which is ours to do it radiates around us in 360 degrees and it supports others in their process of finding and doing what is theirs to do so that it, it has a it has an empowering effect you mentioned the living classroom and, and so the story that's there is I never talked about my psychedelic work to my students, but I found that as my psychedelic, my so-called private psychedelic work went deeper and deeper, my students began to be impacted. They, when I would go through death and rebirth processes, <laughs> they would begin to go through, through completely separate conditions or circumstances, their own personal death and rebirth life transformation processes. 
and, and our minds began to interpenetrate uh, in synchronistic ways inside the classroom. When I would just be reaching out of the emptiness, just to think of an example, to illustrate some point I was making about teaching re world religions or something. Students began to come up to me after class and say things like, you know, it's funny you use that example that you did today. That's exactly what happened to me this week. And these reports kept coming in. And at first I thought it was just a coincidence, but over time I began to realize that there was a deeper living synchronicity manifesting between their lives and my life, their mind and, and my mind. It was as if their souls were slipping messages to me, helping me know what they needed to take the next step. And this is, this is just the way life works. W the best way to contribute to the empowerment of other beings is to do what is our work to do and to do it really well. And that empowers other people to do what is their work to do. Chris, you are doing your work so beautifully. <laughs> you are doing your work so beautifully. Thank you, Bernie. You're very welcome, Chris. Uh, it's been a real pleasure real pleasure talking with you and and uh getting a contact high um. <laughs> <laughs> thank you bernie and thank you for your work and helping heal the world helping us understand the magic that the world is at its deep level yes yeah this psychosphere is a mantle Atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.